Take your Bible this evening, if you would please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, please. Two verses we'd like to read tonight, verses 6 and 7. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 9, just two verses, so we'll read them in unison together this evening. But as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. Let's begin on verse 6 of 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Ready? But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we thank you now for this evening. Thank you, Lord, again for the opportunity we have uh, to open up your word together. We pray that you will minister to us tonight from your word. Thank you for the good music this evening. Thank you, Lord, for uh, the good spirit here in the service. Lord, we pray that you'll help each of us to give you our undivided attention now for these next few moments together. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Got this on. I hope that I'll encourage you to uh, take care of yourself during these days of, what was it today, almost 60, and by Tuesday it's in the 20s with a opportunity for some snow tomorrow night. And it's going to be, uh, so when, whenever the weather changes like that, it's easy, it seems like sickness gets hold of people. And uh, so please be, be careful and uh, take care of yourself, especially those of you who sing, all right? We need you, okay? <clears throat> Arthur DeMoss is a familiar name, possibly, or the DeMoss Foundation is something that you might be familiar with or have heard of. Uh, Arthur DeMoss was a very godly businessman, built one of the most successful businesses of its kind in America, <clears throat> and he amassed a fortune of nearly half a billion dollars. He passed away or went home to heaven in 1979, and his family of his wife and seven children have carried on uh, that foundation that he established, and uh, they give literally millions and millions of dollars to different organizations, they, they do not publicize who they give to. And uh, they, if you receive any of their uh, charitable contribution, you have to sign a statement that you will not publicize them either. And uh, that's the way he wanted it. And he is very uh, firm in his beliefs and firm in what he believed in. And uh, during his, <clears throat> towards the end of his lifetime, uh, stock in his company plummeted. And I was reading that he lost $360 million in four months. We, we can't even imagine that. That's $3 million a day. Okay, do you understand that? That's, um, that's more than anyone had previously lost in such a short time. Now, DeMoss believed in giving, and he was a generous giver to his home church as well as other Christian organizations. And you would think that with that loss, as devastating as it was, that he would have to cut back on his giving. But he didn't. In fact, he increased it. He said, the Lord gave me everything I have, it all belongs to him. If he wants to take it away, that's his business. I will do anything God wants me to do. I don't lose any sleep over it. I still have a wonderful family. <clears throat> if God takes away everything he's entrusted to me and calls me to the mission field, I'm ready to go. All he needs to do is open the door. So he placed his trust in God and not his fortune. And God honored his faith and obedience and eventually restored all that he had lost and much more. And that fortune is still being used for the cause of Christ today. You understand, 
the Bible talks about how all we have has come from God. What do you have that you did not receive? It's all come from the hand of God. When back in the book of Chronicles, when they were building the temple, they gave such, such a generous offering to the temple and they said, Lord, when we give, we're only giving what's already yours that you've given to us. And so it's easy just to give it back to you. And so you realize who the source of your wealth is. And I think we've established before here that we are all wealthy in this room. You, you say, well, no, I don't have much. No, compared to 95% of the rest of the world, we are wealthy people. And we have been blessed beyond measure. And so it was during World War II that that slogan, I mentioned it this morning, give till it hurts, that's where that slogan came from. And many people gave that way during World War II. And, and so that saying kind of became a, the cliche that we brought into our Christianity about giving till it hurts. But I think that falls far short of what the Bible says how our giving ought to be. Uh, it doesn't ever talk about give till it hurts in the Bible. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It goes against what our attitude ought to be when it comes to giving. The Bible says that we ought to give until it feels good. You know, it's interesting, in the book of Acts, um, Peter quotes Jesus. He said, as Jesus said, Acts 20 verse 35, as Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. You say, well, where, where is that found in the Gospels that Jesus said that? You know what? It's not recorded. We don't have any record in Scripture that Jesus ever said those words. Now, do I doubt that He said it? Not at all, because the Holy Spirit of God told us that He did. So I'm sure He did, but I think this, I think more than just saying it, I think they saw Him live that. I think they saw Him exhibit that in His life. And so they knew that it was more blessed. Blessed means it's, it's more happy. It's, it's, you're, you're happier and you're more joyful if you'll give rather than receive. And that's a, that's a maturing thing. When we're coming up in, in a few weeks on Christmas time, and you, you, you understand that adults feel differently about that than children do. When it's Christmas time for children, they're only thinking usually about what they're going to receive. What am I going to get for Christmas? And you have to carefully sometimes hide presents and find clever places to keep them from trying to find out what they're getting. Okay? It's all about they can't wait to, they wake up before, you know, dark 30 on Christmas morning and they're ready to get you out of bed and run down there and tear open the presents. Why? What am I getting? What do I have? What's under there? That's the excitement is about getting. But as you, as you mature in your life, you find that Christmas time isn't about receiving. It's about giving. And, and if you've ever, any parent here understands the joy that you get by watching your children receive those gifts. And, and be happy, and the joy that it brings them is not half the joy that it brings you because you got to give it, okay? You, you understand, as you grow and you mature, you get away from wanting to receive and you want to give. And it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. In this passage we read here in the book of Corinthians, the Lord said every man ought to give as he purposes in his heart and don't give grudgingly, don't give of necessity for God loves a cheerful giver. It doesn't sound like that he's telling them to give till it hurts. It doesn't say that when, when you ought to, offering comes by you ought to have a pained expression on your face. That it's difficult to put this in, difficult to give this to God. No, that's not the attitude at all. It ought to be, well, to happily give it to God. A week from, or this coming Saturday evening, for the Big Ten Championship game over in Indianapolis, 
Just heard on the radio today, if you're going to uh, go to that game, you'll drop $150 for a ticket in the upper section and probably $225 to $250 to sit in the lower section. Now that's just to have a seat. If you're going to park and eat anything while you're there, you'll probably drop another $50 to $100. And if you're going to stay in a motel that night, you'll drop another $200 to $300. And guess what? I don't know what Lucas Oil Stadium holds over there. Do you know, Brother Mark Hort, what the capacity of that stadium is? I'm guessing 60000 or so, 70000 and it'll be packed. And no one will be complaining about how much they had to pay for a ticket. No one will be complaining about how much money they're putting out for this game. You see, they'll gladly give that up. They're not saying, well, it really hurts me to pay this money to see this game. No, they gladly pay it to watch it. So we give until it feels good. The second thing I want to share with you tonight, and there's, there's going to be more, but this second thought here, and by way of introduction, is that it, it delights God to give to us. And, and if we are going to be like Him, then we ought to delight to give back to God. It's a... We, we want to not just give to God, but give to others. Because when you give to others, you're giving it to God. We'll say more about that in just a little bit. But God gives us... In fact, the Bible says that we're able to work in the book of Ephesians, we're able to work and to labor and to earn a living so that we can have to give to those that need it. Not, not, not just so we can have more and get more and store more and, and pack it up. It's so we can share with others. Now I want to share with you tonight just a few reasons on why we should learn to give until it feels good. And I'm not trying to hurt you, I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to get you to experience the blessing of God and the joy that comes from giving. The first thing I want you to share with you why we should give until it feels good is it, it gives us a sense of peace and, grat and, and gratification. Peace and satisfaction, if you will. There's something about giving generously to the Lord's work are giving to people in need that gives you a real peace and satisfaction. I was reading about a Boston florist named Henry Penn who told how two young boys and a young girl came to his shop one day and said, we are the committee and we want to buy some pretty yellow flowers. Do you have any yellow flowers? He, he'd like them better if they were yellow because he had a yellow sweater. And he looked at him. he said, Where, are they for somebody's funeral? And the children nodded and fought back the tears. She's his sister, explained one of the boys. He was a good kid, but a truck yesterday. We were playing in the street and we saw it happen. And the other boy said, well, we took up a collection. We have 18 cents. Would roses cost a lot, mister? Yellow roses. Touched by their story, Henry Penn said, you know what? I happen to have some nice yellow roses here that I'm selling for 18 cents a dozen. And they walked out. The children paid him the 18 cents. And he walked out with a beautiful bouquet of yellow roses. And Henry Penn said, I felt uplifted for days. Because I had the privilege of giving. I had the privilege of sharing with someone who had a need. You know, possibly people are frustrated. Possibly you could lessen your frustration if you'd learn to give. To meet other people's needs. Giving doesn't diminish what we have. It's an opening through which we can receive. You know... You're in 2 Corinthians. Go to your right a little bit to the book of Philippians. Would you please? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians chapter 4. Would you look there with me? 
<clears throat> Paul writing to this church. It was a very uh, special church to him, and this is one of the reasons why. It was a happy church, and it was a joyful church, but notice what he said in Philippians 4 and verse 15. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and, what church? Receiving. But ye only. I said, I, when I left Macedonia and went on on the missionary journey, no church communicated with me. But you. And you communicated with me as far as giving and receiving. He puts the two together. You remember in Luke 6 and verse 38, the Bible says, Give and it shall be given unto you. Giving and receiving. God always links the two together in the Scripture. One person had this testimony after hearing a series of sermons on stewardship, and he wrote this to his pastor. He wrote, During these past three weeks, since the sermons on stewardship, I have increased my giving and I have felt invigorated by it. In fact, I felt a release. I have been enslaved by fear. I was afraid to give God what I should because of my bills and other obligations. But as I studied and I prayed and meditated on the messages, he said, I made up my mind to give 10% of my income right off the top before I paid my bills or bought groceries or anything else. And he said, I had a, cease, a sense of peace come over me. Now, he said, I'll admit, that the anxiety returned when I made out the first check. In fact, I almost tore it up and made out another check for half the amount. But I made a promise to God that I was going to give Him His 10%. And I wasn't going to back out no matter how much Satan wanted me to. And by God's grace, I will continue to give that amount. You see... When you give God what's rightfully His, there's a great peace and satisfaction that comes. In the RU ministry, Brother Currington talks about how God was developing him in his early days uh, just as he was uh, getting clean off his drugs and sober from alcohol and uh, trying to do the right thing. And how... He's, uh, he tells the story of being in the uh, store to buy a picture frame and he sees a picture frame and he picks it up and not exactly what he wanted, but it was close enough. And as he's walking through the store, he sees the picture frame that's exactly what he wanted. So he takes the picture frame that was okay, but not exactly what he wanted and sets it on the shelf and picks up the other one. And as he walks away, he feels the conviction of the Holy Spirit saying that's not where that picture frame belongs. And he wants to ignore it. But he said, I obeyed, I went around, picked the thing up, took it back where it was, and put it where it belonged. And then he said this, and I felt the overwhelming love of God come over me because I had done what God wanted me to do and not what I wanted to do. You ever experienced that? Knowing you did what God wanted you to do and not what you wanted to do? I've known the opposite of that when I know I did what I wanted and not what God wanted. And, and I, I, I think maybe some of you could relate to that as well. That's not a very good feeling. <laughs> that's, a, that's kind of a gnawing in the pit of your stomach that isn't very comfortable. I, I'd much rather have the the, the warmth and the, the, the blessing of the Holy Spirit come over me as I know I've done what God wants me to do. That's the way it is with giving. That's the way it is giving God what's rightfully His. And so it'll give you that peace and satisfaction in your life. The second reason we ought to joyfully give is <clears throat> it's through giving that we become partners with God in His work. God's people 
have always used the resources that God has given to them to carry on God's work. Now, let me ask you a question. Can God, can God do it all without us? <laughs> sure He could. He created everything without us. When, when He fed the 5,000 men besides the women and children that day, He took that little boy's lunch and He blessed it, and then He broke it and He distributed it to the disciples. And they gave it to the people. Okay? Did He have to involve the disciples? No. Could Jesus have just prayed and before everybody there appeared a meal? Absolutely. He has the power to do that. And, and yet He wanted to involve the disciples. And in the same way, He wants to involve us in His work. That's a, very, that's a high privilege. That's a great honor that I get to be involved in the work of God. Back in the book of Exodus, when God told the people to bring offerings of gold and silver and bronze and fine linens and other fabrics, precious stones and gems to build the tabernacle, the people were delighted to give. Until finally, it's the only time in the Bible where God told Moses, the people bring too much. Tell them to stop giving. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Uh, some of you have been saved a long time. You can't imagine a pastor getting up and saying, listen folks, uh, we just have plenty of money right now. Just uh, hold off giving for a while. It just doesn't happen. Because people don't give that way. Like they did here. Now God, by the way, they had all that to give. Remember, what were they in Egypt? They were slaves. Do slaves have a lot of things? You think of slaves as having gold and silver and precious stones? No. But when they left Egypt, when they had the, the, the blood on the doorpost and the death of the firstborn, remember what God told them to do? <clears throat> Go spoil the Egypt and get And listen, they were so glad to see Israel leave, they were giving them everything. They were cleaning up. Here, take this, just go. Here, take these, go. And they were giving them gold and silver and precious stones. And I'm sure the people thought, wow, look at all this stuff. Man, do we have a lot of good things here. They didn't know that later God was going to say, remember all that stuff I, told, I gave to you? Now give it back. Give me some of it. But they did. They did. They gave it. And so much that willingly and happily that God said they, they're bringing more than enough to finish the work. It's an amazing thing. But the same thing happened in the book of Acts. Look at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 and also we'll look at Acts chapter 4. This is a church in Jerusalem. <clears throat> you know about verse 41, when the same day there were added them about 3,000 souls. 3,000 were saved and baptized on that day of Pentecost. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common. And sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And then you look at the end of chapter 4, <clears throat> where we're introduced to Barnabas. But it says in verse number 34, Neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet and distribution was made unto every man according as he hath need. And then it talks about Joseph, who was uh, surnamed Barnabas, uh, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. This was a giving church. Nobody required this. Nobody made it mandatory. But they just said, man, let's, let's sell things we have. Let's give that money. And the, the apostles can distribute that to people who need it. And we'll give that way. So no one would be in need. These are people, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, that understood the joy of giving. The joy of participating in the work of God. The joy of being a partner with God in His work. And it's the greatest work in all the world. Did you know that you can put God in your debt? What? Look at Proverbs 19 with me, will you? Proverbs 19. 
wonderful promise. Proverbs 19. Look with me, please, at verse number 17. <clears throat> the Bible says, He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord, and that which he hath given will he pay him again. He that hath pity on the poor, what's he do? Lending that money to who? Yeah, you're loaning it to God. And God says, you, you loan money to me? I'm going to pay you back. And God will pay you back. But how do you loan money to God? You give to the poor. You give to those who are uh, less able to, to do things than what you are. When you contribute to a missions trip and allow somebody to go who ordinarily wouldn't be able to go, you're lending it to the poor. When you pay for a young person to go to camp who normally wouldn't be able to go to camp, then you're lending it to the poor. When you give to help somebody pay a doctor bill or, or get clothing for their children or provide some need that they have, then you're lending it to the Lord. Caring for a need, listen, caring for the needy is a work God is always involved in. And He wants to be involved in, and we get to partner with Him in that. God always pays His debts. All right? He won't be a debtor to any man. And He'll reward us when we have pity on the poor. And then, of course, when we give to God's work and we give through the local church, we become partners by supporting the ministries and missionaries of the church of God. Can't have the ministries we have. In fact, when I, I wish you could see the faces of some of the guys, and Kevin may have been one of these, I don't know. But <clears throat> when they, they ask in prison, they say, well, how big is your church? And I tell them that, you know, we'll have maybe 120 on a Sunday morning and, you know, maybe 90 or so, 100 on a Sunday night. They're really shocked. They expect it to be bigger, don't they? Because of having the RU ministry in the prisons and giving them free books and, and supplying the curriculum and not asking anything from them. You see, that's a testimony. How can you have a ministry like that? Because of the giving of God's people. That's how. Because that's, you're, you're partnering with God in His work. Of the, I forget how many I said th uh, Tuesday night. Is it almost 500 that have been received Christ as their Savior this year through the prison ministry? You see, that's a partnership with God in the saving of the souls of men. Just had a testimony uh, from a fellow, Gary, on Friday morning at Madison who uh, testified. It was a year ago in November, November 17, that he was at CRC and he on a Thursday night, accepted Christ as Savior. Stood up to give a testimony of that fact and how God's changed his life. And uh, he was telling me when he, when he gets ready to get out, he has nowhere to go. He said, sure you do. You have somewhere to come in Grove City, Ohio. And we'll help you get started and get you, get you, get on, get you on your feet and get you going another direction. And uh, tears come to his eyes. They just, they just, uh, they just can't believe that. And uh, listen... That's, that's partnering with God in his work. And, and there's a fellow named Bill Smith who wrote a book called As Stewards of God. And he talks about when he was a boy in his early teens. He went with his father to a Sunday afternoon business meeting, just a small church. In fact, they had just a little frame building. As he recalls, there were six to eight men who made up the male population of the church. And they were meeting about the possibility of having regular preaching. Which meant they didn't have a preacher just come once a month to preach, but they would have a preacher come every Sunday to preach. And have preaching every week instead of once a month. But he said, just when it looked like the motion would be voted down, Bill said, I heard my dad say, I'll give $5 a week on it if you can rake up the other 10 Bill said, I remember thinking, Dad, you're crazy. <laughs> you're out of your mind. He said, I knew my dad only got $20 a week and had six people to support. Not only that, Bill's thinking as a young teenager, he said, I could have bought a BB gun and all the shots I'd ever need, which is one week's amount. <laughs> I could have worn shoes that had no holes in the soles. What was my dad thinking? 
But as he wrote in this book, Bill said, little did I realize what my father bought that day. And I doubt he really knew himself. But he said, from that day forward, church meant something to me. I wasn't quite sure at first what it meant, but I knew that there must be something pretty important about it for my dad to give $5 a week for it, which is 25% of his income. You know, if you're looking for excuses to not give to God's work, the devil will always have an excuse for you. January, well, we've got to pay off the Christmas bills. February, well, the fuel bills are high. The car needs work. March, well, we've got to pay income tax. April, we've got to get clothes for Easter. May and June, well, it's getting to be the end of the school year and graduations to attend. July and August, well, there's vacation expenses need to get paid. September, well, the children are going back to school. We've got to get their school clothes bought. October, winter clothes come in and doctor bills need to be paid. November, it's Thanksgiving and a trip out of town. December, well, there's Christmas shopping to do. There's always an excuse. There's always a reason. If you're going to be partners in God's work, you have to make it your priority to give God what's His. The Bible teaches in the book of Leviticus and all through the Scripture that not, it says the tithe is the Lord's. It means it belongs to Him. So if you, if you get uh, $500 a week, $50 belongs to God. It's not yours, it's His. That's why if we keep it, we're taking away from God what's rightfully His. Now, the truth is, we learn from the New Testament and really from the Old Testament as well, everything we've received is from God. It all belongs to Him. And you know, it should never be hard. <clears throat> it should never be difficult for us to give away other people's money. Congress does it quite well. <laughs> give away our money easily. But listen, you're not giving. I'm not, well, I don't know if I can afford that. No, wait a minute. Uh, who's me? I can't afford anything because I don't have anything. It's all God's. It belongs to Him. So I simply want to know if God wants me to give to this. In fact, that gives us our third point. Giving generously develops a greater trust in God. Giving generously develops a greater trust in God. Look at Matthew chapter 6 with me, would you please? Are you okay? You know, I... I appreciate you being here tonight. You know, I told Bob I, had a, I hesitated even announcing what I'd preach on tonight. For fear that some people say, well, I ain't coming. <laughs> going to talk about giving. Uh, forget me. Man, I'm not going to be there. Uh, you're here because obviously you want to give and you want to do what God wants you to do. And I appreciate that. In Matthew 6, verse 19, the Bible says, Jesus said, Lay not up for yourselves treasure upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. It's really about trust, isn't it? It's about taking God at His word. Do I lay up my treasures here, or do I lay them up in heaven? You know, the decision to become a Christian doesn't take great faith. It only takes a little faith in a, in a great Savior to, to be saved. And your faith grows from that point. That's why faith can increase. And the disciples, disciples said, Lord, increase our faith. It's, it's not hard when, you're, when you grow up in a Christian home. It's, it, it's almost the natural thing to do to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. You hear about it from the time you can hear anything. You know about Jesus and what He's done for you. The, the challenge Christian parents have that bring their children up in a Christian home is, is measuring the true understanding of that child. That they really comprehend what it is to receive Christ. Because a child will want to do it just because they, they, they hear that's the thing to do. But maybe not have the full understanding of it. That's why uh, uh, all of our workers in, in our classes and such understand that 
Listen, if, they're, if the child is in your class and their parent and their parents come to church here, their parents need to deal with them for salvation. They know the level of their understanding. They know whether they get it or not. We, <clears throat> when Andy was a young kid, it was just two weeks ago. No, it wasn't. Um, <laughs> when he was a young kid, you know, people would come to us in church and saying, why don't you let Andy get saved? How come he's not saved? You know, because you'd ask Andy at, at four years old, you know, uh, if you die, are you going to go to heaven? He said, no, if I die, my feet will burn in hell. That was his response. My feet will burn in hell. Not his body, just his feet, but that was enough. And they said, man, he knows he's going to go to hell if he doesn't get saved, so why don't you leave him to Christ? Because he didn't understand yet. He didn't have that comprehension yet. So we waited until he was ready to, to say, I want to receive Christ, and that he understood what that was all about. Now, while it's easy for someone like that, for others of you who didn't grow up in a Christian home, when it came time to receive Christ, that was a big step of faith for you. you say, man, I, that, was, that was a big deal to receive Christ as your Savior and, and to become a Christian when you weren't reared in a Christian home. When to, to become someone who maybe you grew up where you not only maybe made fun of people like that, but other people you were hung around with made fun of people like that. And now you're faced with the dilemma, am I going to become one of those people? <laughs> am I going to become one of those born-again people that I used to make fun of? Will that be me? That was a big step of faith. And sometimes people have to leave behind ungodly influences and lifestyles to live for Christ. Some have left friends and family and even jobs that might be detrimental to your Christian walk. That takes faith. But the Bible says we're to walk by faith and not by sight. Walk means take repeated steps. So I'm to take repeated steps by faith and not by sight. And, and so we walk by faith. We obey God by faith. We give by faith. Faith. What's faith? Taking God at His word. God says, that's what I'm supposed to do. I'm going to do it. Well, I just don't see how... Well, wait a minute. Then you're going by sight. Don't go by sight. Go by faith. Go by what God says. It's, it's, we, we tend to want to make sure everything looks good and just right before we take the step of faith. And especially when it comes to giving. We look at our paycheck. We look at our bills and say... No way. Hmm? Brother Philemon, you say, no way, Jose. Huh? But yeah, that's sight. That's sight. That's not faith. It's uh, letting, trusting him in spiritual matters, but not trusting him with physical matters, with material things. Now, the Bible says, if God spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him freely give us all things? What are we worried about? God gave us his only begotten son. If he'll give that, I'm worried about him supplying some dollars for me. Food, clothing, shelter, meet my basic needs. That's not a worry at all. Let, let go of the tangible for God and trusting Him is the test of our faith. Do we take God at His word? Do you know that He promises that He'll provide for our material needs if we give generously to Him? So, ah, preacher, I want to believe that, but I just don't know. I just don't know. Well, it takes a matter of faith, doesn't it? So what did God tell the children of Israel? You know what he told them in Malachi chapter 3? He said, prove me now, saith the Lord of hosts. And see if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing so that there will not be room enough to receive it. Wow. I remember hearing Dr. John R. Rice preach and he gave this illustration about a Pastor Kuykendall in Texas. Dr. Rice was from Texas. 
He said, H.Z. Duke. This would be probably in the middle, early to maybe 1930s. He was the founder of Duke and Ayers Nickel Stores. Imagine that. We were talking about uh, Drew lost his first tooth. And they were talking to uh, Josiah, who's got lost his two front teeth at least. And uh, now all he wants for Christmas is his two front teeth, right? And uh, we were talking about the uh, putting the tooth under your pillow for the tooth fairy to come. And they were talking about, uh, I think one of the other kids, Tanya, said got a dollar for their tooth. I said, man, it's pretty good. I remember getting a quarter. But she said, yeah, but you could buy something for a quarter then. You can't hardly buy anything for a quarter now. huh?" And uh, that's true. But she goes, you know how hard it is to get a dollar out of Bob for a tooth? <laughs> truth, huh? Yeah. That's the tooth truth right there, huh? Well, this guy was Duke and Iyer's nickel stores, and he asked him, this, this Duke who founded the store asked the preacher if he believed in tithing. And the preacher said, yes, I do. Well, then he asked him another question. You know what he said? Do you practice it? There's a lot of people who believe in it, but that's different than practicing it. And he said, no, I do not. I believe in tithing, but I can't practice it. You see, I have 13 children at home. Every meal, 15 of us sit down at the table. I receive only $125 a month. I have to maintain my own horse and buggy for constant traveling. It's just impossible to take care of all the needs of a family of 15 out of $125 a month and have money left to tithe. So I believe in tithing and I preach it, but I cannot practice it. Mr. Duke told him, I want you to set out to give God at least $12.50 every month as soon as you get your salary. Then as you feel led, you give more. And I promise you that if you need help, I will give it to you. You simply write me a letter and say, Brother Duke, I'm giving a tithe, but I miss the money. I need it for my family. I've given this year, so, I've given this much so far this year. And I promise you, I will send you a check by return mail. Are you willing to try tithing on that basis? And of course, Brother Kuykendall said, I was very excited at the offer and I began tithing. And he said, that year God took care of my needs in unexpected ways so that I never had to send a letter to Mr. Duke. But near the end of the year, I realized that I had trusted Mr. Duke's promise to provide for me more than I trusted God's promise to provide for me. Now I had proven God's promises and found that He took care of me and my big family on a small salary. I found that $112.50 a month took care of our family better with God's blessing than $125 did without being under the blessing of God. Will you put God to the test? Will you prove Him and see if He won't open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing? That He'll take care of your financial obligations and much more? And by the way, I want you to know, it grieves my heart. We have missionary families, the Morelands and the Perex and, and the Yoders, Brother Bowman. We have these, these folks who go to churches to city of churches to partner with them for their work. And it grieves my heart when the, when the pastor says, well, we have to wait and see. We have to wait and see what comes in. Well, are you operating by sight? Or are you operating by faith? Isn't that interesting? See, there's churches that will preach, you give faith promise. What does that mean? That means you give it and you trust God to bring it back to you. You're not saying, God, you bring it in and then I'll give it to you. That's sight. You're saying, I'm going to give it by faith and trust God to supply it back to me. That's faith promise. But then the church, the church 
doesn't operate on the same principle. When things get tight financially, do you think, do you think the pastor, the leadership tells the people, oh, you're in a tight spot financially, why don't you just not give to missions for a while? You think that would happen? But what do churches do when things get tight? Well, better cut back to missionaries. Do we walk by faith or do we walk by sight? I'll guarantee you the blessings of God we've seen at this church in any financial way that we can have the ministry of RU and we can have the radio broadcast and we can have the outreaches we have is because we give faithfully to missionaries. We don't, we're not going to cut back on giving to missionaries. Okay? That, that isn't going to happen. That's where the heart of God is. And we're going to give by faith and not by sight. And God honors that. Without sight, it's impossible to please Him. Oh, that isn't what that says, is it? Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. So we have to give by faith and not by sight. And that's good for individuals and it's good for churches as well. Somebody ought to say amen right there. It'd be great to have a group of people. And we have some. I know we do. We've got to for a congregation our size to receive what we receive. But I tell you this, I'd like to find some more people who would like to find out what it's like to give until it feels good. Okay? You get to partner with God in His work. You get to find peace and satisfaction and you get to develop a greater trust and faith in God. God has to get involved. You have to believe that He'll take care of you. And it's a blessed thing to walk by faith and not by sight. Let's give until it feels good. Let's pray, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you, Lord, for everyone's attention tonight. Thank you, Lord, for a church that wants to hear your word, wants to learn how we ought to give, and Lord, whether it's little as the widow who gave two mites, or those in the Old Testament who gave of the gold and the silver and the precious stones, Lord, we just want to give joyfully, willingly, of that which You have given to us. Forgive us for thinking that it's ours. Forgive us for not being good stewards of what You entrust to us. But help us tonight to put you first. Help us not to allow Christmas gifts or selfish things that we want to do to bind us from giving and partnering with you in your work. Lord, help us increase our faith that we'll trust you to care for us. Thank you for allowing us to participate in your work.